All right, cool. Um, so obviously you're here in Australia with uh, Glenn Hughes performing the whole uh, Deep Purple classic mm -hmm. albums. Um, I know you've done one show in Sydney so far, so how was that? Uh, it was really a great first show. I felt like a band that had played together a long time. Mm. And um, I've never played with Lockheed, you know, the uh, organ player, or mm. Pontus. I played with Glenn, you know, going back to, I think, 2003, but it was always so many different versions of the band. Yeah. And to be honest, this version feels the best to me. And we've only done one show, oh, two wow. rehearsals. Okay. And uh, uh, Lockie's frightening at Pontus. He's laying it down. And there's a, you know, you can have all competent players in a group, but you put guys together, as you see in like a lot of super groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we love Soundgarden, we like Rage Against the Machine, and you put these guys together, it's just, usually it's never as good as the. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. So there's a synergy with certain people, and I feel like this really feels cohesive and. And it feels great. Now, what was the reason for it being so cohesive like that? Did you do a lot of rehearsals beforehand, or? No, we only did two rehearsals. We arrived here and got in the room for two days. Oh wow! So it just clicked straight away. All jet lagged, and <laughs> the third day was the show. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's a blast. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the set list, obviously, you know, there's so much stuff to pick from. How did you go about picking out what songs you wanted to do? Well, I mean, that's up to Glenn. And uh, he came up with it. And I think, you know, he was thinking about the era, uh, you know, the whole era of Deep Purple, even pre him coming in there, you know, there's just a couple of songs that people want to hear, like Highway Star, they're just mm -hmm. such powerful songs, you yeah. know. Um, and he picked certain songs like Holy Man that he's featured on and, you know, and uh, um yeah, just it's a it's a great uh, diverse set list. You know? Okay. I think we go from Highway Star and right into Burn. It's like, <laughs> like an hell, man. <laughs> well, there's so many classic songs, you know, so many memorable hits. Um, what's your relationship with some of these songs? You know, did you grow up with a lot of Deep Purple stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was always listening to Richie Blackmore and remember, you know, learning Death Alley Driver and mm. um, you know a lot of these tunes and, and some stuff from Rainbow as well with him, Stone Cold and you know I used to see him live back in the day and saw Purple and Rainbow as well and um, certainly Coverdale and all this sort of thing. So it was a big part of my childhood and me being a really a Strat player. I mean I love playing Les Pauls and different guitars, but primarily I play Strat and Richie is you know. Besides Jimi Hendrix, he's the, he's the Strat guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And his kind of uh, classical influence with not just playing pentatonic and blues, but mixing, you know, harmonic minor and these different sounds in there, like Gates of Babylon, when I heard that back in the day, I was like, ooh, you know? Mm. So you definitely, I've incorporated a lot of that into my playing. And you, after a while, you, you, you forget who you, some of your influences are. You go, wow, I'm really influenced by him more than I realized. Yeah, and sometimes it takes, uh, I guess, uh, an outsider to sort of tell you who you sound like, I guess, sometimes. You know, you don't really realize who you've been influenced by or inspired yeah. by. Yes, yeah. Um, so, how what is it like to, to be playing these songs live then in front of a crowd? Like, because, you know, obviously these songs are so, you know, um, legendary that does it sort of feel a little bit sort of, not overwhelming, but um, do you feel any kind of pressure to make sure that you, you know, you you're spot on or yeah um well i mean the thing the the relief knowing that richie kind of did whatever he wanted live so he he never even played the same solo twice mm. so i'm kind of going back and listening and trying to cop some of the original recorded parts like smoke on the wall i want to play that solo note for note because i know he only played it one time in his life note for note and that's it. And then he never did it again. Yeah. Live is just like something completely different. <laughs> but I'm certainly trying to stay in the vein of what he would do. Not copying everything he did, but, you know, uh, the essence of Richie Blackmore, mm. you know? And then you're not going to see two-handed tapping, these dive bombs and stuff where it sounds like Zach Wilde and Eddie Van Halen. Just, I'm not going to do that. I can do that. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't do that anyway. But I think Glenn knows that I'm going to come in and and really pay homage to the sound that Richie created the best I can. Yeah. And stay within that framework, you know. Okay. But also, we want to in, uh, embrace the, uh, you know, like Made in Europe and Cal Jam, where they just jam and really, you know, because it was about that. They were, you know, wanting to blow people away and hit them over the head. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, 
you know, it wasn't reserved in any way. I mean, they were going for it, man. Yeah. 17-minute jams and the <laughs> one, you know. And, a lot of improv going on. Do you, do you yourself enjoy doing a lot of improvisation on stage? Yeah, absolutely. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Even, even with my material, it's like there's certain things within a solo I'll stick with a little bit, but it's all about improvisation. Mm. It's the same thing as having this conversation. I don't know what I'm going to say, yeah. what you're going to ask. And, you know, music is about reacting to the other musicians. And with Glenn, he forces you to go in certain places, you know. There's a, there's, a, there's a hint of danger with him, you know, that's <laughs> cool, you know. It's not... If you go to Steve I concert, and he's a wonderful guitar player. Yeah. But he definitely likes to rehearse his parts, and then his fans want to see him play those solos note for note. Yeah. To see that he can do it, and he always can, and that's great. Uh, but uh, I definitely like the art of improvisation. Yeah. You know, more in my playing. Yeah, definitely. No, I'm a big fan of improv stuff because, uh, as you said, you, you don't know what you're getting, you know. Yeah. It's it's a real sort of rock and roll show, which is essentially the essence of what rock and roll is about, you know. It's all about that um, the unexpected, you know. Yeah. I find if I do something cool one night and go, ooh, I'm going to do that again tomorrow night. It's like a, jo it's like a comedian telling a joke. <laughs> I'm going to pull that one out again. That one will be great. Yeah, yeah. It's never as good. The same time. <laughs> so I've learned to, even if I have a cool moment where I go, ooh, I played this thing and I really dug it. I'll try to go somewhere else the next time. Yeah. Because yeah. every time I go to that same place, like, that sucked. <laughs> it wasn't as cool. So uh, is there anything that you think is going to be different about tonight's show in Perth then? Or? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of, like, you fool no one. I mean, we take these, there's a break where I just take a solo by myself. Um, and the same with Lockie, his intros. He never plays the same thing twice. Mm. So right off the bat with those things, you never know mistreated Glenn wants you know an intro to the song and then an intro to what the recorded solo is like Richie Live you know made in Europe um, he just he kind of goes off right for a while and does a thing so you never know where it's going to head mm. certainly the structure of the song but then we're, we're stretching yeah. so you know it could be great or it could be <laughs> <laughs> you never know <laughs> you never know yeah yeah but hopefully uh, you know it's going to uh, well, we're looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Um, what we kind of wanted to—I want to touch on some of the stuff that you've done in the past as well, because looking at your body of work, it's it's truly amazing who you've worked with and what you've done, the amount of work that you've actually done as well. Is there anything in particular in the past, aside from obviously working with Glenn Hughes, that's really stood out for you over the years? Uh, well, that's an interesting thing. Um, hmm. You know, I like the idea of. Uh, you know, uh, playing with different musicians, like playing with Chad Smith and did a thing with Jason Bonham and Danny Carey and all these different drummers and how different they play and what they bring out of you, mm. you know. Uh, for instance, playing with Chad, I have a band with him called the Bombastic Meat Bats. Yes. And, uh, you know, when we go off, like when I go on a, in a frenzy in a solo, he'll go out on the on the diving board with me and support me in that way and really... Where a lot of like rhythm sections, the drummer will just stick with the bass player and stay on that groove, and you're kind of out there by yourself. Mm. So, uh, you know, playing with him over the years and the intensity level that he has and the fearlessness that he has in his playing, uh, that's been quite quite an eye opener. You know, um, you know, everybody's different playing with you know, and a guy like Phil Mogg, he's such a different singer to Glenn Hughes, mm. and you know, his personalities and. You know, it's just been great, great ride. But every every situation is completely different. You think maybe you'll come down back to Australia and, and do a bit of a tour around here, or? Uh, you know that if somebody wants to pay for the plane tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, that's from... always the thing. Like we're ready to go anywhere, but yeah. you know, uh, yeah. it's tricky. You know, you have to and and balancing being a freelance musician and schedules and the yeah. drummer Shane, he plays with this you know, band that sold more records than Madonna over in Japan. He's there <laughs> seven months a year. You know, so it's tricky. Yeah. You know, but certainly we'd love to just go and you know, tour anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Australian musicians, some of the, you know, I, I came here in 2000 and had a jam with Tommy Emanuel. It's the first time I met him. Oh, he's a great guitar player. Yeah. He's better than that guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, he's, he's a good guy, good guy, good guitar player. We have a few guitar players here in Australia, but it's none that's really sort of broken out to that level of like, you know, the Steve Vyers and all that kind of stuff, you know. Are you familiar with a lot of Australian guitar players aside from... You know, like Brett Garson and uh, Frank Mbali and um, Shaq Jones, Australian? Uh, I don't know, maybe, actually. I thought maybe so. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, Brett's a wonderful guitar player. Mm. I remember the first NAMM show I did in, in 1993, a kid from Toledo got all this to prove, thinking I got all these chops. I play like Paul Gilbert, meets Randy Rhodes. <laughs> I see Brett Garson play. We're playing at the same booth. I'm like, oh, God, this guy's so good. <laughs> like Jeff Beck meets Ed Holsworth. You know? And what a sweetheart of a guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the Australian musicians, you know? Singers like Jimmy Barnes... It's incredible. Virgil Van Adi. Played with him once about drawers, you know? Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff. Um, so who do you consider to be some of your biggest influences? Because I know in your bio it's, it's, it's mentioned, you know, Van Halen and stuff like that. Um, how did you get into music? How did you get into guitar playing specifically? You know, my brother always wanted to play drums. And uh, I think my dad wanted to move. He, he had to con him, you know, move into the rental house. He's like, oh, I don't want to move into the other house. Well... So he had to buy him a drum set, he had to barter with, you know, giving him what he wanted to move to another location, and then it was my birthday, and, and uh, we grew up pretty poor, living with our mother, and moved in with my dad, and it changed our lives when I was 12, mm. really, like, it's a whole long story, but, you know, we kind of lived as, like, gypsy kids, moving all over every month, and for years, and uh, so when my father got custody of us, basically it was my 12th birthday, and he bought me a guitar, and that was it. All right. You know, and never have had anything, you know, even just a common thread of, you know, a, a regular school to go to. You know, I mean, we were literally moving like every month, just random, mm. with an alcoholic mother. So I was at the point in my life where I wasn't going to take anything for granted. I just went full bore, hell bent. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. You know, and nothing else. And I've never done anything but play guitar. Was there any particular uh, event or a live gig or maybe just a particular band that sort of like spoke to you and go, I want to do that? You know what? I mean, embarrassingly, well, maybe not embarrassing to some people. If I told Glenn's manager, yeah, I got into music because I went to a Kiss concert, he'd be like, oh, they're bloody awful, <laughs> you know. I loved it because I was at the right age and yeah. it just really was, and he's still great, you know. And, yeah. Uh, just to see the power and the epic performance. It was one of the last Kiss concerts of the Dynasty Tour, you know, the original guys. And, you know, and then I went to like Ted Nugent, who was, you know, the local favorite, and he was, the, he was the king of the world in 1978, you know. He was headlining over Scorpions, ACDC, and Thin Lizzy. I mean, he was the headliner. Yeah. With all those bands. And, you know, and I was just absorbing everything. Then Randy Rhodes. I think... I wanted to be Randy Rhodes when I was 14 and saw him live. Mm -hmm. You know, I stood 10 feet away from him, maybe 45 days before he died. Oh, you know? wow. And uh, that was crushing. He What's he like to see in person like that? He was, I couldn't take my eyes off him. He was yeah. incredible. And now there's some video surfacing, which is really exciting. I'm like a little kid watching. <laughs> oh, my God. So yeah. I couldn't stop watching the whole show. Yeah. Ozzy was... God bless him. He was crap. I mean, he couldn't sing at all. His voice was shot. Mm. Right away, everybody's like, oh, he's got a cold or something. He's just, he's cracking. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, poor guy. And they opened with Over the Mountain. Like, uh. But it didn't matter. The band was so great. Yeah. I was like, man, I couldn't believe it, you know. And uh, after Randy Rhodes died, I felt like heavy metal, you know, the 80s and MTV just got really awful. The band started to suck and... Next thing you know, Van Halen's playing keyboards. I'm like, ah, oh, this is just, this whole thing just sucks. And then, so, I had my metal band, Edwin Dare, and we did that thing. But heavy, heavy metal was pretty much crap mm. by the mid-80s, you know? And uh, so I started getting into guys like Alan Holsworth and John Schofield and studying classical guitar and, and really putting a lot of that harmonic flavor into my, you know, my brand of hard rock. Yeah. You know? And it wasn't until Pantera came out that I was like, yeah, we're back, motherfuckers. Oh, wow, so you really got into Pantera then? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I love, uh, I love Dimebag and that. And the... Well, Dimebag was obviously a huge Randy Rhodes fan as well, yeah. so he was very influenced Same by thing, him. Same thing, Kiss, Randy Rhodes. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I had other influences, like, um, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan was a huge influence, and I saw him live twice. And, you know, and I always go back, and I'm into George Harrison, and, you know, I'm into... Uh, 
Jimi Hendrix, of course, you know. Mm. I'm still, like, finding Hendrix recordings, like, <laughs> Jesus, criminy. But then you go back to guys that they were influenced by, you know, um, Curtis Mayfield and these kind of players, and Steve Cropper, and I, I listen to everybody, Charlie Christian and Django Reinhardt. Mm. You know, as you walked in, it was Wes Montgomery, you know. Yeah. John Schofield. And what about today? What do you think of today's current music scene? Is there anything out there that you think is uh, sort of... Because it's obviously saturated now with the whole digital age and all that kind of stuff, uh, and it's and so accessible at the same time. But is there anything today that you think is doing any? Is is anything sort of special or? Um, you know, I'm kind of so busy playing, and when I'm not working, and traveling, or at airports or on stage, mm. I'm with my kids at the beach having fun. Yeah. You know, trying to raise a family. All right. So. You know, um, I don't know that much of what's going on, mm. I hate to say. I mean, there's new bands, heavy bands like Gojira. I mean, they're not new. They've been around 15 yeah, yeah. years. But yeah. I've seen them twice in the last year and love them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite singers, been around like 20 years, Jimmy Necco, band Hours, you know. Okay. He's, he's for me, the you know, one of the great singers alive. Um, and I'm seeing some new guitar players... You know, through Facebook and Instagram, like, who's that kid? Wow, he's mm. a great player, you know? I see more stuff that I don't like than do like, but there's hope for humanity, you know? There's some there's some really cool uh, cool musicians out there that are, uh, you know, younger generation that are great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard to sort of weed them all out because, as I said, it's, it's so saturated now because it's so easy to find bands that are out there but it's hard to sort of pick out the really good ones from all the, the bad ones you know because uh, I guess back in the day it was like you were sort of fed this stuff through the radio and magazines and stuff like that whereas now it's like you've got this whole world of music yeah. that you know yeah record record companies filtered out the the crap in the 70s because mm. they were in the 60s they were cultivating the artists and you know a band like I mean, how many records did, you know, Judas Priest have before they had a top 20 song? You know, they had like 10 albums yeah, out already. Yeah, that yeah. would never happen. Not now. No. Not now. Nobody's going to, you know, you got one chance and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, th there's no time to grow. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's really difficult. Um, so we'll see. And, you know, there's not the budgets now. Um, yeah, but it's kind of weird. You see somebody like The Who and, oh, you know, there's what's the point of making a record right now? You know, it's financially doesn't make sense. I'm thinking, you're a multi-millionaire, brother. <laughs> you know, I'm still a thousandaire and I'm making records because I can't not make records. I have to. I have the music inside. i got to let it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for some of these, you know, old rockers to use that as an excuse, it's like, that's why I admire Robert Plant because he's always breaking new ground, doing his thing. Mm. And not just playing the nostalgia card. I mean, we all want to see him get together with Led Zeppelin and do that. But he's got other fish to fry, and I respect that. You know, he's mm. out creating new music and doing different interpretations of Zeppelin. And, you know, if and when the time's right, he'll go up and do it. Yeah. We're just really excited and uh, humbled to be here uh, rocking out and, uh, you know, carry on the legacy of uh, the great music that Glenn wrote with uh, Deep Purple. So uh, I personally, I'm honored to uh, to just be sharing the stage with such a legend, and uh, and he's a dear friend, and and uh, so thank you so much for the support.